I'm going to ask you to just go ahead and join me in a word of prayer, and uh, then we will begin our service this morning. Dear Lord, we are uh, just rejoicing today over uh, so many uh, blessings that you have brought into our lives personally, uh, so many blessings that you have brought into our life as a church, and we don't know why you have seen fit to be so good to us, but we recognize that all of these blessings are from you, and we exalt you and thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you for sending your son to redeem us. As we focus on that thought today of this, this idea of Jesus Christ redeeming us by his blood, purchasing us from the slave market of sin. Lord, help us to see it more clearly. Help us to understand it in a, in a, in a new and a fresh way. And I pray, Lord, that you will teach us to rejoice in the redemption that is ours through Christ. So help us in this hour to fix our, our thoughts, our hearts, on praise to you that you will be honored even as we hear your word, even as we thoughtfully engage in the Lord's table uh, during this morning hour. Lord, just please, please help us to receive all that you have to offer us today. And I pray, God, that you would receive from us an offering of praise that really is worthy of your name. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Kind of guide our thoughts into our uh, theme of worship, the, the theme of redemption. I'd like to just read a couple of verses from Psalm 103. They'll be on the screen, or you can read along in your own Bibles if you wish. But Psalm 103, just the first uh, three and a half verses of Psalm 103. And Psalmist says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. And that is going to be our focus really through the entire service, just to consider this thought of God redeeming us from destruction, that you and I deserve destruction because of our sin, and left to ourselves, we will reap destruction because of our sin, both in this life and in the life to come. And Jesus Christ has come to redeem us from that, to buy us from, from the, the, the penalty and the, the power of sin. And one day, he will re return and release us finally from the presence of sin. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and start by singing. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand with me. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. We're going to sing all the verses of this hymn. And as we're singing, the Bible Truth Music Group is going to come. And they're as well going to lead us in worship. Charles Wesley, as he wrote this particular hymn, was overwhelmed by the redemption that he experienced and trusting Jesus Christ as a savior. And he wrote, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my Redeemer's praise. Let's sing.
Isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. Oh, the Lord loves praises to be sung. And in our next hymn, we're going to um, look at a hymn that Fanny Crosby wrote on um, again overwhelmed with the redemption that Jesus Christ brought to her. It's uh, redeemed, number 520. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite, great, uh, through his infinite mercy. And then she exclaims, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redemption is precious. So let's just sing it with all of our hearts. Redeemed. <laughs> Today will also be the last time that we will take a special offering up for uh, the Burles um, uh, for their commissioning to Malta. And I'm going to ask Brother Chris if you could return thanks for us, please.
And the, for our final hymn before the message, we're going to sing, I will glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. And, you know, our, the glory of the Christian is his Lord, is his Redeemer. He is the only one that, by whose merit, we are able to be children of God. I will glory in his name. Let's stand as we sing. I invite you to join me this morning in the book of Ruth, in Ruth chapter 3. I trust you've been encouraged by what we have already sung this morning about redemption. It is one of the most precious doctrines of the Bible. Every person is born a slave to sin, and every person chooses to live under the bondage of sin, and every person will remain hopelessly there unless God interferes. And that is exactly what God did through Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 says that we have redemption through his blood. We're free from slavery. We are free from the bondage to sin and death and hell. And that's why we sing, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Redeemed, I love to proclaim it. I will glory in my Redeemer. And as we return To Ruth this morning, we encounter an absolutely stunning picture of redemption. And I'm excited to expose this to you from the Word of God and then to celebrate the redemption that we have in Christ around the Lord's table together. But I'd like to just take a moment and just ask God to guide our thoughts and to help us as we discover the truths of His Word here this morning. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we do want to humble ourselves for just a moment and recognize our desperate dependence upon you to see what your word has to say. We wouldn't dare arrogantly uh, pursue trying to understand spiritual truth apart from the help of your spirit. And I'm thankful that you have promised us your Holy Spirit, that he exists to guide us into all truth. And I pray that you will allow the spirit freedom to uncover truth to us, that he will help our ears to understand, help our hearts to 
be inflamed, our minds to be engaged with what is taught in your word today. And I pray, Lord, that we would all profit from the living word today. And we ask for your help in these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We will jump into the story in Ruth chapter 3 and verse 14 in a moment. But before we do, about eight weeks prior to the events of Ruth chapter 3 and verse 14, two widows by the name of Ruth and Naomi returned from the country of Moab to the city of Bethlehem. Naomi is the older of the two widows. Ruth is actually her daughter-in-law. But they had both lost their husbands over a, a period of time of roughly 10 years while they were in Moab, and they come back to Bethlehem hopeless and helpless. Bethlehem is the hometown of Naomi, but it's a foreign place to Ruth. Ruth is actually from Moab, but both of these widows have this in common. They're destitute. They have absolutely no hope for the future, and if God does not come through for these women, they are sunk. They have nothing to look forward to. In chapter 2 of the story of Ruth, God brings into their world a man named Boaz. Ruth unwittingly stumbles into his field to pick up scraps in order to provide for her and her mother-in-law. And Boaz learns of Ruth's diligence and commitment to her mother-in-law, and he decides to reward her. And he shows great kindness to her far beyond what any landowner was required to show. But Ruth only knows his name at this point. He's just a nice man named Boaz who took an interest in her. She's a foreigner, after all, and doesn't really know people around town at this point. Well, when Ruth came home with this huge bundle of food and tells Naomi what had happened in the fields that day, Naomi is overjoyed. And when Naomi hears the name of the man, she expresses great excitement, and there's a reason. Here's what she says. If you look in chapter 2 and verse 20, at the very end of the verse, Naomi says unto Ruth, after hearing about Ruth stumbling into this field of this man named Boaz and how he is so kind to her, she says at the end of verse 20 of chapter 2, this man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. This word kin, the first word that she uses to describe this man just means a relative. But the word kinsman, the second word that she used to describe Boaz, has a much deeper concept. It has the idea of a redeemer. He's the the kinsman redeemer. Boaz was one of the guys in Naomi's family who had the responsibility slash privilege of redeeming or buying back things for the family. He was the one who could buy family members out of slavery. He's the one who could buy back family land that had been sold or lost. He was the one who had the responsibility to make sure that the needs of his family were met. He's the redeemer of the family. It was a concept deeply woven into Israelite culture. And later in the story, in chapter 3, in a somewhat bizarre scene that took place at the threshing floor of Boaz, Ruth proposes marriage to Boaz. And in doing so, she reminds him of his position in the family. If I draw your attention to chapter 3 and verse 9, Ruth is going to use this same expression to remind Boaz of his position in the family. At the end of verse 9, she says, Spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. It's the same word in chapter 2 and verse 20, the kinsman redeemer. Naomi and her husband Elimelech had left Bethlehem ten years prior to this. And their property had been sitting there all that time untended. And if things go on as the way that they're going, and Naomi dies with no children or grandchildren, this land will eventually become the Redeemer's land. It will go to him. He will inherit it. And Elimelech and Naomi, their, their family name will just be wiped off the face of the earth. They will be eradicated from the pages of history. And the guy who will get their land is this Redeemer. He's the the one in the family who will keep the the land in the family, and so that way the land stays with the family. And what Ruth is proposing to Boaz on the threshing floor that night is for him to marry her so that the two of them could actually buy the land together and then actually conceive and have children to carry on the family name of Naomi and Elimelech. 
She and Boaz could seek to have a child together so that Naomi will have a descendant and so that her family line will continue in Bethlehem. And Boaz cannot believe what Ruth is offering him. He's absolutely thrilled by this privilege slash responsibility that he had to the family of Naomi as the Redeemer. He's the one who can buy this land, and he is flattered that Ruth would come to him and consider partnering with him to rescue Naomi's family. And he says to her in chapter 3 in verse 10, he says, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as thou followest not young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, fear not, I will do to thee all that thou requirest, for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman. But there's a major problem. And immediately Boaz sees it. Look at verse 12. Boaz continues and says, And now it is true that I am thy near redeemer. Howbeit there is a redeemer nearer than I. Naomi and Ruth were both right when they refer to Boaz as the redeemer in the family. He is a kinsman redeemer. But Boaz knows that there is actually someone who is ahead of him in line with this privilege slash responsibility. And we don't know the name of this man. The Bible never tells us who this nearer kinsman is. We don't know anything about him as far as his, his biography or what happens to him down the road. But he's standing in front of the line of Boaz. And Boaz does the right thing. It's clear at this point that, that Boaz likes Ruth. He's shown some attention to her back in the field several weeks prior to this. And, and now that Ruth has made herself available to him, he seems totally enthralled with her. But late that night on the threshing floor, Boaz reminds, is, is reminded of his responsibility, but yet he knows that there is a closer relative than him who has first dibs on Ruth and the land. And he does the right thing. Verse 13, he says, Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman or the redeemer's part. But if he will not do the part of the redeemer to thee, then will I do the part of the kinsman, redeemer, to thee. And we're all holding our breath a bit because Boaz might just lose Ruth over this, he might just lose the land. But Boaz is willing to take the risk in order to have a clean conscience. And because of how Boaz leaves this, we realize that if, if God works this thing out, it's going, to, it's going to be God who does it. Boaz is not going to manipulate the situation. He is not going to do anything unethical to make this thing happen that he wants so desperately. He leaves it in the hands of God. And he says at the end of verse 13, he says, As the Lord liveth. And he brings God into the equation, reminding the reader, all of us, that this is ultimately going to be under God's control. He will perform the duty if, if, God, if, if God allows him to do it, but he's not going to do it a wrong way. And so he says at the end of verse 13 to Ruth, he says, just rest your pretty head. <laughs> Lie down until the morning. It goes on in verse 14, she lay at his feet until the morning. And she rose up before one could know another, and he said, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. I mean, how do you sleep after all the emotions of a night like this? How do you sleep when, when so much is left undone and so much is yet at stake? Here's how you do it. You go to sleep because you have a clean conscience, and you have a faith in God that he is going to work everything out. You have not manipulated anything. You have not done anything unethical. You're just leaving it in the hands of God, and that's exactly what Boaz and Ruth are doing. There's nothing more they can do. They have plans, and the plans seem good. They have done everything as uprightly as they possibly could. The only thing left to do is for God to work. And so at the end of verse 14, he says, Let it not be known that a woman came unto the floor, and he, and he sends her on his way. And they're not covering anything up here. They're simply avoiding any appearance that something evil took place that night, because nothing evil did take place that night. But he doesn't want to leave her empty-handed. And so verse 15, he says, before she goes, he says, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, bring your garment, and, and hold it out. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her, and she went into the city. Now I know that Ruth is a tough woman. Because this is a load of upwards of 60 pounds that he puts into her lap, so to speak, and she's going to carry home in her garment. 
And what Boaz gives her is not unprocessed grain. This is, this is fast food. This is from, straight from the threshing floor. The guys have already beat this stuff out, and this, is, this stuff is ready to eat, ready to cook with. And Ruth goes back to an anxiously waiting Naomi. This whole thing was Naomi's idea after all, and she probably hasn't gotten a lot of sleep that night. Look at verse 16. It says, when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, who art thou, my daughter? And she obviously knows who Ruth is, but she is hoping that Ruth will say, I am the fiancé of Boaz. That's what she wants to hear. And Ruth responds in verse 16, and she told her all that the man had done to her, And she said, these six measures of barley gave he me, for he said to me, go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. And if you've been paying attention to the story, what Ruth just said is of the utmost significance. Two months earlier, before the harvest even started, and if you go back to chapter 1 for a moment, two months earlier, when the widows first moved to Bethlehem, Ruth stood next to Naomi When Naomi said, I am absolutely empty, and she uses the same word. Look at chapter 1 and verse 21. When they first come back to Bethlehem, she testifies to all those who are around, and Ruth is standing right there, I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me again empty. It's the same word. And Naomi is referring to the loss of her husband and her two boys. She is absolutely destitute, absolutely empty. And Ruth heard her say that. And now in our text, in 3 and verse 16, Ruth is using the same wording, and it's, it's loaded with significance. She says, Boaz would not let me return to you empty. Same word. And Ruth's inference to Naomi is that God just might use Boaz to make them a family again, to make them full again. God just might use Boaz not only to provide food and to fill them with, with food like she's holding out here, but he might actually be able to give them more. He might actually make them full with descendants and with a future again. And these are the last words that Ruth speaks. You'll never hear Ruth utter another word in all of the the scripture. And she just silently waits for these events to unfold. And I love Naomi's response to this. And to me, it's the best thing that Naomi has said yet in the story. Look at verse 18. She says, sit still, my daughter, speaking to Ruth, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Isn't that great? So sit still, because Boaz is not going to be sitting still. Boaz is going to be in a tizzy until he gets this thing ironed out. And and Boaz is the kind of guy, we already read about him in chapter 2 and verse 1, that he is a, a mighty man of valor. He is an influential man in town, and when Boaz speaks, people listen. And Naomi says that Boaz is going to get this thing done. He's a man on a mission. And so Ruth can just sit tight and relax. And I love this principle that comes out of this story. God expects us to strategize. God expects us to make plans and to diligently seek to carry out those plans and to, and to go forward doing things for his name, doing things that we need to do. But at the end of the day, we leave them in his hands. We do everything that we can to be wise and to strategize and to to be diligently working and serving, but at the end of the day, we leave it in his hands, and we just sit tight and relax. We don't have to worry. And God says to us, as we just do right and live wisely before him, you've done everything you can do. I'll take this now. It's in in my hands. Leave it with me. Just, Just sit tight and relax, because I will not relax. There's a verse in Psalm 121 and verse 4 that says that he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. And since God doesn't sleep, you and I can. We don't have to worry about all the unknown circumstances in our lives. If we have done wisely and we have done right, we can leave it with him because he's going to work it out. He is not going to rest until he performs what is good for us and what will bring him glory. The ball is now in Boaz's court. And Naomi had a pretty good idea that he would be taking the ball and running with it. In her words, he would finish the thing in verse 18. And in chapter 4, he does. He does finish the thing. Look how verse 1 starts of chapter 4. Then went Boaz up to the gate. And the gate was the place in the city where you would hold public meetings or conduct business in those days. In the Old Testament, it was the gate. Now, 
As you come to the New Testament times, if you were living in Greece, you had a place called the Agora or the marketplace where you would conduct business and hold meetings. And then um, if you were living in Rome, you had this place called the Forum where you would do this kind of thing. But in the Old Testament, you often see throughout the Old Testament where important people are meeting at the gate and they're discussing business, they're making decisions that will impact society, political things. But most significant to our story, there's a passage in Deuteronomy 25 that I want you to see. Deuteronomy chapter 25 for just, just a moment. There's a group of individuals in Old Testament days, during the days of Judges and even back in the days of Moses, there was a group of people called the elders that made important decisions in society. And they often made these decisions at the gate of the city. In Deuteronomy 25, if we were... If I was living in the Middle East 3,000 years ago with my wife and I had no children and I died, my brother would have a societal obligation to get together with my wife and raise up a child to allow my name to continue. And it sounds absolutely bizarre to us, but it's absolutely normal to these people. And God set forth this pattern in Deuteronomy 25 and verse 5 where he says this, If a brethren dwell together and one of them die... And have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name be not put out of Israel. I mean, this was a way to protect and provide a future for, for, your, for your dead brother's family. And as you can imagine... Sometimes the living brother didn't want to do this for a variety of reasons. He may not have any desire to go in unto his brother's wife and, and raise up children. What then? Look at verse 7. It says, If the man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. And now the elders who are meeting at the gate have an obligation to do something about it. And here's what they're supposed to do. Look at verse 8. Then the elders of his city shall call him, the guy that won't perform the duty, and they shall speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I'd like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of of the elders, and loose his shoe from off his foot, and spit in his face, and shall answer and say, so shall it be done to that man that will not build up his brother's house. And then verse 10, his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that had his shoe loosed. And you say, ooh, <laughs> shoeless Shemaiah. And every going around town, look at this, look at shoeless Shemaiah here. Man, you, that's just really got to hurt. That would not hurt you if I said this to you. But if you were living 3,000 years ago in the Middle East, this would have cut deep. You would have had a black mark hanging over your head everywhere you went. You would have been the guy that refused to take care of your family. Today we might call a guy like this a loaf. We might call a guy like this a loser. This is, this is the guy that sits in his basement and plays video games while his mom is working at Walmart 60 hours a week to support his habits. This is the kind of, this is the kind of sting that was intended by this ceremony. This will all play into Ruth's story in just a moment. But I want you to observe for now that in the ancient Middle East, much business, including kinsman redeemer business, took place at the gate under the leadership of the elders. And that's why Boaz goes there. Now go back to Ruth chapter 4 if you would. When Boaz comes to the gate, someone just happens to drop by. Verse 1 again of chapter 4. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by. Just the night before, Boaz was talking about this guy. This is the guy that immediately came to his mind and said, I need to talk to that guy first because he's got first dibs on Ruth and on Naomi's land. And he just happens to show up. And, and, and you and I are knowing at this point that he didn't just happen to show up. That's how the author shows it to us. It just, he just happens to walk by the gate the next morning as Boaz goes out there. But this is the guy that Boaz was just talking about. God brought their paths across. This is no accident. 
You have all these people throughout this story just going here and going there and thinking this and thinking that and, and doing this and doing that. But, but all behind the scenes, God is just orchestrating all of these things out for his glory and for the good of the people. And Boaz hollers at this guy. He says, ho, such an one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And, and, and again, you see that Boaz is a rather influential guy because when he speaks and he yells at some guy walking by, he says, you come here and sit here, the guy comes and sits. This is, this is not just an ordinary guy in society. This is like one of the, one of the Irvings or one of the McCains in our culture. When, they, when they're going to say something to you, you're probably going to listen and, and follow instructions. And that's the kind of guy that Boaz is. And perhaps this nearer kinsman has no idea what's about to hit him. And Boaz calls to the others, several other men. Verse 2, it says, he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit ye down here. And they sat down. Everybody just does everything that, that Boaz says. He's an assertive, influential man. Everyone listens to him. And so now we have a town meeting of 12 people at the gate. We have Boaz, we have the nearer kinsman, redeemer, and then we have these 10 elders. And these elders were there to perform an official decision, to, to, to witness an official transaction that was taking place. He appeals to these guys to witness and to ratify whatever decision was made between him and this nearer kinsman. In verse 3, he says unto the kinsman, the redeemer, Naomi, that has come out of the again of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Even though Naomi had been gone for nearly a decade, even more than a decade, the land was still hers. And the man who would inherit it would be the redeemer. But Boaz is offering to, Na to, to this near redeemer, he says, no, Naomi's selling it now. You don't have to wait until Naomi dies off. She's actually selling the land now, and it is your responsibility slash privilege to buy this land and to keep it in the family. And the man pulls out his money pouch and says, I'll buy it. That's all the word redeem means. I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. I'll, I'll purchase it. And the picture-perfect ending to this story all comes crashing down. We're all wanting to say, no, this is not how it's supposed to go. Boaz is supposed to get the land. Boaz is supposed to get the girl. But it's going to be okay, because there's a catch. There's a string attached to this purchase, and, and Boaz very strategically brings up the catch in verse 5. Then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. If this guy were to buy the land from Naomi, he would need to consider seriously his responsibility to Naomi's family. He would need to seriously consider his responsibility to Elimelech, Naomi's deceased husband, and, and to Ruth, who is right there. She needed to be looked after, and her, her husband's name is about to be extinguished from the face of the earth. And in buying this land, he needed to consider his responsibility to this family. Ruth is the wife of a dead man whose name was on the verge of extinction, and the Redeemer needed to consider this. Notice again how it's worded at the end of verse 5. He says, you need to raise up the wife of the dead, or to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And Boaz, Boaz is pounding, pounding, pointing out that if this relative bought Ruth's land, he would not be benefiting much himself at all. This wouldn't just be adding to his inheritance, this would actually be adding to his responsibility and perhaps even shrinking his inheritance. He would now be working to secure a future for Malon's descendants, Ruth's deceased husband. So basically, being a kinsman redeemer is not at all what it's cracked up to be. Certainly there were some, some privileges and blessings that came along with this role, but there was also some major responsibilities, some major sacrifices that needed to be made. And this guy sees all those sacrifices right away, and he totally reneges. He just got done saying, I'll buy it, no problem. But now he's like, ah, I'm not so sure. Verse 6, he says, and the kinsman said, the redeemer said, I cannot redeem it from myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. We talked some about this Hebrew concept of chesed last week. And there's two ideas of chesed that is woven all throughout the book of Ruth and really throughout the entire Old Testament. 
There is this steadfast loyalty, and in fact, oftentimes you'll see it translated as either steadfast love or loving kindness. That's usually how the word is translated. It has this idea of steadfast loyalty to somebody, but on the other hand, there is always a cost with chesed. You, you, you steadfastly commit to someone, but it's going to cost you something. You're going to have to give up some personal preferences in order to live out this concept. And Ruth and Boaz are sparkling examples of this in the story. They are both giving up preferences in order to meet the needs of others. Ruth gives up everything to stay loyal to Naomi and Naomi's God. Boaz is about to give up much in order to stay loyal to his family and to his God. And in contrast to Ruth and Boaz, you have these two somewhat insignificant people in the story who really are not doing this. And they're not bad people, they're just normal people. So you have Orpah who when confronted with the decision to to go and take care of Naomi in this new land, when she really thinks about it, she decides to go back to Naomi, or back to back to Moab. And, and she leaves Naomi and, and she just does the normal logical thing and goes back home. And in contrast, you have Ruth who makes all these sacrifices to stay loyal to her mother-in-law. And now you have Boaz who is showing this steadfast loyalty. And, and, and Boaz is his contrast. The, 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 uh, the person who is compared to him is this unknown guy. We don't even know his name. Sure, he'll, he'll take the benefits. He'll, he'll take the land. He'll take something that will increase his inheritance. But if it's going to cause him to give up some preferences, he's like, no way. He's not going to show Hesed. And you have these contrasts throughout this story. And, and there is this magnifying of this concept of Hesed. That in God's economy, in God's world, God shows steadfast loyalty and sets aside preferences to, to reach his people, to stay loyal to his people. And he is honored when people who have received his steadfast love, in turn, show this to others. And Boaz and Ruth show us these things. And here, so he said, this, this normal guy, this guy who does the expected, the logical thing, we never hear a thing about him again. He says to Boaz in verse 6, he says, Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. In other words, I would not redeem it. I will not do this because I am not willing to give up my own inheritance or to mar my own inheritance. And even though we're kind of disappointed in this unknown guy, we're all breathing a sigh of relief because this is what we wanted to see. This is what Boaz wanted to see. But he would rather lose Ruth and the land to displease, than to displease God. I mean, Boaz at any point in the last several verses could have ruined this story. He could have just steamrolled his way through this whole thing. He's a very influential guy in society. I'm sure he could have just you know, started moving people around and making this happen. But he's not going to do it. He could have told some lies. He could have manipulated the situation in order to make it turn out good for him. He could have withheld some very important information in order to work all this out for him, but he doesn't do it. He is going to stay loyal. He's going to be a man of character and just do right. What an example. Don't fall into the temptation that in order to work things out for yourself, you'll need to cut corners or, or neglect responsibilities or fudge the truth somehow. Just do right, and God's going to take care of it. And in every given situation, the right choice is usually the hard one. The right choice is usually the one that's awful risky. The right choice is the one that in your mind you're thinking sometimes that this is going to lead to some really disastrous ends for me. Sometimes we're tested in these situations, but God will always bless those who do right. He will always work things out for those who do what's right. So we just tell the truth and we, and we trust God to work things out. We just share the gospel with that person as the Spirit prompts us to, and we just trust God to, 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 to work on that seed of the word in that person's heart. Just put money in the plate as, a, as, as you cheerfully give, and just don't worry about your future. Let God take care of you as you obey him and do right. Teach and discipline those kids like God told you to, even though sometimes you don't feel like it, and even though it seems like there is, there's no progress being made. But trust God and his word that if you do these things, he will bless them. Just pray about that impossible thing in your life and just leave it with him. Whatever your situation is, if you do right and trust God, he's going to work it out. And certainly we ought to plan and work and do all we can to bring about certain ends. Boaz is doing that. He is strategizing. We don't let go and let God, but we, we do right and we just let God work. Psalm 37 verse 5 says, Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. 
And Boaz is no fool. He's thought through every step, and he's implemented his plan carefully. He has a desired end in mind, but he's not going to manipulate things to make his plan work. And Ruth is doing the same thing. Where's she when all this is happening? She's sitting at home. That's what Naomi told her to do. You've done everything you can, Ruth. Now just sit still and wait. And that's what Ruth is doing. And God goes to work for these people. And Boaz can now, with a good conscience, buy the land and get the girl that he wanted. And there's a symbolic act that he must do by which he declares his intentions. Look at verse 7. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. And so the author's inserting this note because already just uh, several generations later, this is written probably during the time of David or Solomon, just several generations later, and this, this ceremony was already defunct. They were already weren't using this by the time of David and Solomon. And so he says, this is how it used to go. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Remember in Deuteronomy 25 when the man refused to redeem his brother's wife? What does she do to him? She yanks off his shoe. And the loosing of the shoe indicates the inability to fulfill your obligations. And the widow would yank off that shoe to show that this was not a good thing. This was not a respectable or honorable thing. And the widow would spit in his face to shame him. But in this case, there's no spitting going on. There's really nothing shameful going on here at all because Ruth's needs are about to be met. Boaz is stepping in and, as a substitute and saying, I'll, I'll do what you can't do or what you refuse to do. And so there's no spitting or name-calling going on here at all. He willingly takes off the shoe to symbolize to the elders that he's, he, he is willingly giving up this right to Boaz. And verse 8 says, Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee, redeem it for thee. And so he drew off his shoe. And now Boaz legitimately has the right to redeem Ruth. So verse 9, Boaz says unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. He wants everyone to know and to testify that this whole thing has been done above board. It's all his. He has bought it all and he is claiming all responsibility for the possessions of Elimelech from this day forward. But more than just his possessions, verse 11, sorry, verse 10 he says, moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of his place ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. And there's more to the story, and we will bring this to a conclusion next time, so please come back. But for today, Boaz will indeed marry Ruth. And Ruth, after all those years of barrenness with her previous husband, will conceive and bear a son. And some women will come to Naomi and they will rejoice with her. And notice why they rejoice in verse 14. He says, they say to her, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a Redeemer. And this is what the story is all about. It's about a redeeming. It's about a buying back. And here is this wealthy and righteous kinsman redeemer. And he lays on his eyes on this very poor and destitute foreigner, a woman from a cursed and pagan nation, in fact. And he seeks her. And she seeks him. And he learns that he is able to help her because he's actually related to her. And he determines to purchase her. And he fulfills all the obligations of the law in order to win the right to buy her. And in order to buy her, he has to sacrifice greatly. He gives up something in order to get something, not only for himself, but for an entire family. And he gets his bride. And his bride gets him. And forever he is honored and rewarded for his act of redemption. Do you see the picture of all this? The son born to Boaz will be named Obed. And Obed will be a father to Jesse, and Jesse will be a father to David, and David will be the great, 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 great grandfather leading to another man in the first century, Jesus of Nazareth. And from eternity past, this Jesus was wealthy and righteous. And he lays eyes on this very poor and hopeless race of sinners, cursed and condemned. 
and he seeks to redeem this race. And Jesus can help us because he's like us. He came in flesh, and he, and he, and he lived the way that we live. He experienced what we experience, and, 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 and he becomes like us. And he fulfills all the obligations of the law in order to, to earn the right, so to speak, to actually perform redemption for us. In order to buy us, he has to sacrifice greatly. He gives up his life, not only to obtain glory for himself, but life for an entire race. And he gets his bride, and his bride gets him, and forever he is honored and rewarded for his act of redemption. And as we close, let me ask you, have you been redeemed? Have you been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ? Jesus said in John 8, verse 34, that whoever commits sin is a slave to it is a servant to sin. You may consider yourself to be the master of your fate, but you're not. You are actually in bondage to sin. Everyone is born into bondage to sin. We choose to live in that bondage, and if we are not redeemed by Jesus Christ from that bondage to sin, we're sunk. And we will pay for the consequences of our sin all throughout this life and ultimately in eternity in hell. But Jesus came to redeem you to release you from sin's penalty and from sin's power. And if you will come to him in faith, he will remove your sin and make you God's child. Titus 2 verse 14 says, He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And if you seek the Redeemer, much like Ruth sought her God and sought her Redeemer in her day, you will find him. He will not cast you out. Romans 10 says that whoever believeth in him will not be ashamed. If you have been redeemed this morning... I'm going to ask you to come and celebrate redemption at this table today. To celebrate your redemption by coming to this act of worship. This is like what those women are doing for Naomi, gathering around and and rejoicing over her redemption. This is why we come to the table, to rejoice over redemption. Jesus Christ has redeemed his church from the penalty and power of sin. And one day he promises as part of our redemption to come back to, for us and to redeem us from, the, from the, all, the presence of sin altogether. And if you've been redeemed and you are walking in fellowship with a Bible-believing church, either this church or another, we welcome you to celebrate this redemption with us today. In a moment, the deacons are going to come and they're going to pass out the elements, the, the bread which symbolizes the body of Christ that was given for us, the the fruit of the vine that symbolizes the blood of Christ by which we are redeemed. And if you have been redeemed, we welcome you to come and partake of those elements. If you're not sure about that, I would urge you just to let the plate pass by you and to enjoy watching this symbol of the gospel, this picture of redemption. Watch it, pray about it, think about what these things are that are happening before you, and, and, and seek this redemption. This can be yours if you come to Christ today, but we would ask that if you are not sure of your redemption, that you don't participate in these elements. These elements are reminders to those who are already redeemed by Christ, those who are already in the family and who understand the significance of what these things mean. I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then I'm going to come, I'm going to stop and just give you a moment to reflect and just about a half a minute of silent prayer where you can just contemplate the things that you have heard today and just to rejoice in the redemption that is available through Jesus Christ. And I'll do that, and as you have a moment of silent prayer, the deacons will come and prepare the table for us this morning. Heavenly Father, we do give you praise for this redemption that is ours. We're hopeless and destitute apart from what Christ has done. And God, it just doesn't seem to be any adequate way to present this glorious doctrine. There's no way to adequately appreciate it, but God, I pray that you will stir our hearts, that you will open up the eyes of our understanding, that we can grasp what it is, this this great salvation, this great redemption that is ours through the blood of Christ. And Lord, even as we come to the table, Lord, help us to see the, the significance of what we are remembering, the hopelessness that we are and have apart from Christ. And God, I pray for those who are not redeemed, who are not in your family, Lord, I pray that you will speak to them, to their hearts, that they will allow this, this presentation, this, this celebration to, to, to stir their hearts and that your spirit will draw them to redemption. We pray that you'll work in each heart. And Lord, we, as we take just a few moments to silently talk to you and to give you praise for the redemption that you've given to us, Lord, stir us, we pray, and hear us.
1 Corinthians chapter 11, when the Apostle Paul gave instruction about what we're doing here today, he encouraged us to examine our hearts and to see if we're really redeemed, but to see if, as well, we're walking in fellowship with him. And if you can say that is the case, we invite you to the table. This is not, this is not something that is forbidden to sinners. Every one of us are sinners. But it is restricted to those who have been redeemed, who understand what these things are all about, who are already participating spiritually in the redemption of Christ, that he has already taken away our sins. And these just symbolize what is already an inward reality. And if this is true of you, if you know that you are redeemed, please come and join us at the table. The Apostle Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. So I'm going to go ahead and give thanks to the Lord for this, and then the deacons will distribute the elements to you. Dear Father, we do thank you again for the body that you gave, the body of Christ that was given for us that we might be redeemed. Lord, I pray that you will stir each one of us as we, as we praise you and rejoice together over this wonderful gift of redemption. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, he took the cup, and this cup is a symbol of the redemption that is through his blood. Colossians says that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, and this is a symbol of that.
the words of Jesus, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. been a joy to remember this uh, redemption uh, with you this morning, but let's not just remember, let's, let's look ahead too. There is part of this that is reminding us to look forward as well, because our redemption isn't finished. Christ has redeemed our spirits by his blood. We, we have assurance of forgiveness of sins because of his body and blood that are given for us. But there is still the redemption of the body that awaits us. And redemption isn't finished yet. It is, it is done in the sense that everything that needed to be done to accomplish our redemption is accomplished through Christ giving his body and blood. But there is still a redemption of the body that awaits us. And Romans 8.23 says, We groan within ourselves, awaiting the redemption of the body. And Jesus said, he said, you do show, or Paul said, that you show forth the Lord's death until he comes. And the church, ever since Christ gave us these symbols, has been celebrating this in worship of what he has done, but looking forward to yet what he will do. And so we're going to sing a hymn in closing of our service, this hymn, Come Quickly, Our Lord, and it is a song about the future redemption that awaits us. And you can remain seated while we sing this, and as we sing this, the deacons will be taking up what we call our benevolent fund. This is a fund that just goes to those that are in need in some way, in a physical way, that our church, the deacons handle that fund, they manage that fund, and will give it to those and distribute it to those who have needs within our congregation or even without our congregation. So you remain seated and just enjoy singing. Come quickly, Lord, as the deacons come and collect that fund. Yeah. 
people said, the glorious redemption that we have, it's ours, it's secured, but the best is yet to come, and uh, that's what this is all about. Trust you've been encouraged. If there's any questions that came into your mind as a result of what you've heard, what you've seen today, uh, I'm available at the door on the way out, and a couple other pastors, Pastor Bart, Pastor Andy, will be back as, as well. Love to greet you, and if we can be of any further assistance to you, we'd love to help you understand that you've received redemption and uh, that your sins are forgiven. We can gladly show you from the scriptures how you can have that assurance. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Herb Hunter if you wouldn't mind uh, closing our morning in prayer, please.